Hey guys, at every step of the way, Napoleon's story becomes even more dramatic. So today we'll review part two of Oversimplifieds on Napoleon. Part one is in the link below if you haven't watched it. And let's go. This video was made possible by Honey. Install now for free using the link below and start saving money when you shop online. After the Third and Fourth Coalition Wars, Napoleon had decisively defeated all three of his main rivals on the continent, and he was now undoubtedly the master of Europe. After the Battle of Friedland, his enemies sued for peace, and they all met on a raft on a river for negotiations. They had been fighting for the past four years, but now Napoleon and Alexander surprisingly got along like a house on fire. They laughed together, they chatted long into the night, they kissed. The two had a lot of mutual respect, and Napoleon even told his wife that if Alexander were a woman, I would make him my mistress. Don't, don't say that. Kind of a weird wife. thing to say to your wife, Napoleon. In the end, they came to an amicable agreement. Russia would lose barely any land, and in return, they'd join France against the UK and invade Sweden. Win-win. On the other hand, Frederick William III was sidelined, and Prussia lost an enormous amount of territory to French client states. Only the UK remained as the last major threat to Napoleon, and they continued to be a big thorn in his side, constantly funding his enemies and using their powerful navy to wreak havoc on French trade and overseas colonies. But what could Napoleon do? The British were safe across the channel. Well, he said, if I can't fight you with guns, I'll fight you with money. Earlier in 1806, problem is that the Brits have a lot of money too. Six, Napoleon had announced the continental system, a total shutoff of the UK from continental trade. No one in Europe was to trade with Britain, and Napoleon hoped that by hitting their economy, he could force them to negotiate. The British economy did take a hit, and they responded in their typical fashion, by going to Copenhagen and blowing a bunch of stuff up. But in general, the British managed to stay afloat by simply increasing their trade with other parts of the world. Many neutral countries found themselves stuck between a rock and a hard place as the two European superpowers demanded they cease trade with the enemy. Hey America, you better not trade with the French or else I'll come burn down the White House. What? This is gonna wreck my economy! I need to start saving money! How the heck? Problem is when you try to blockade, uh, you don't want to choose the country with the largest navy on earth and with the largest access to uh, resources on earth with its colonial empire so that's not a, a sound strategy i guess am i gonna start saving money making peace with the russians a continental blockade and blowing up copenhagen sick of being blown up for doing almost nothing and under significant pressure from napoleon the danish officially sided with france but napoleon's blockade had the biggest effect on continental europe who were now cut off from a major trading partner one that controlled the seas and held a rich growing empire and a lot of countries didn't fully comply portugal a traditional british ally refused to take part no problem napoleon sent an army and invaded but it wasn't just portugal many of napoleon's allies were also suspect your majesty it the whole of europe is uh, is smuggling at this point because the blockade is massively hitting their economy. It seems that Spain isn't properly enforcing your blockade. Spain? Why not? Well, it appears they've been trying to find a way out of being your ally since they lost their fleet at Trafalgar. What is with these people? It's almost like everyone's only pretending to be my ally because they know otherwise I'd beat them up. The, the answer is in the question, no? Do I even have any real friends? Are you my friend, Pierre? Say yes or I'll slap you. Napoleon had come to mistrust his ally to the south, and in particular, Napoleon thought the Spanish royal family were an incompetent mess. All right, Carlos, you've got to get it together. How can I trust you when all you do is go hunting, meanwhile you let this ambitious nobody who dislikes me run the country, and you seem to be the only person in the universe who doesn't realize he's boinking your wife? And what's worse? Who the heck are you? I'm the king's son. I just overthrew my dad. So, actually, now I'm the king. You people are the biggest cluster of shameless, narcissistic idiots and all around just the worst people I've ever met. Here, have a Kid's Choice Award. French forces, many having conveniently already entered Spain to invade Portugal, occupied Spanish forts, and Napoleon invited the Spanish royals to France to help mediate their differences. All right, we're here with the royal family of Spain. So, 
Fernando, you've been accused of plotting against your father and vying for the Spanish throne. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, Napoleon, I just think we're right. Well, I've got the test results right here. Fernando, in the case of the Spanish throne, you are not the king. (laughs) And Carlos, you are also not the king. I'm the king. Actually, what we need to remember here is that the Spanish royal family is the Bourbon, is kind of the, the same who were ousted from the throne during the French Revolution, but that's still a very bad move from Napoleon. Napoleon made his brother the king, but for all intents and purposes, Spain was now his puppet. He expected the Spanish people to be over the moon at the removal of their unpopular royal family. Imagine his surprise when it turned out that people don't really like to be subjugated by a foreign power, least of all one who had previously attacked the Catholic Church. And so the people of Spain revolted. Brutal fighting broke out as bands of armed Spaniards ambushed French troops across the kingdom, and vicious atrocities were committed on both sides. In addition to fighting the regular Spanish and Portuguese forces, the French had to contend with tens of thousands of guerrilla fighters throughout the Spanish countryside. The British even took the opportunity to land an army led by the future Duke of Wellington. And now, British forces were defeating French ones on land. Napoleon briefly went to Spain in person, and he did drive back the Allied armies. But before long, his attention was needed elsewhere. So Spain will be a quagmire for like the, the rest of Napoleon's reign. It will take a lot of reserves and manpower. It forced Napoleon to even more overstretch his, uh, his troops and commit its best soldier there. And, you know, it's always the, the paradox with um, trying to invade an hostile country. For example, you mean you need 1,000 soldiers to uh, invade it, but you need 10, 10 times more in order to control it. The whole thing became a nightmare for the emperor. He excelled at traditional warfare, but this was something more akin to Napoleon's Vietnam. The whole conflict would keep hundreds of thousands of French soldiers and resources bogged down for years. Napoleon was never able to break the will of the Spanish people, and this problem weakened his position in Europe. (laughs) Hey Francis, want to go to war with Napoleon again? I don't know, Britain. He's already whomped me three times. I'll give you a bazillion pounds. Well, okay. Seeing that Napoleon was now caught up in Spain and with some British funding, Austria decided maybe, just maybe, this time, they'd have a chance. So did they? No. Napoleon defeated them in just four months. It was quick, but it wasn't exactly easy. The Austrians had been watching Napoleon and learning, and they had made some reforms. While Napoleon, after years of war, was increasingly having to rely on inexperienced conscripts. So this time, the Austrians gave him a run for his money. The Fifth Coalition saw some of the bloodiest battles to date, including Napoleon's first major defeat. And when he did finally defeat the Austrians at the Battle of Wagram, it was a very costly victory. Still, Napoleon had yet again kicked Francis's butt, and as part of the peace terms, Austria lost a bunch more land. Not long after, however. See, the problem here is that, okay, Varam is still a victory, but it showed that uh, Napoleon was not invincible and he had some weaknesses. Then you have uh, a very debilitating peace treaty for Austria, and they will feel angry about it. And... The first occasion they will have, they will fight again against Napoleon. And that's a big mistake from Napoleon. Uh, Basically, he knows how to win a war, but he does not know how to win a peace, how to humiliate uh, his uh, enemies. Napoleon and Francis came to another agreement. It was decided that Napoleon would marry Francis' young daughter. But wait, doesn't Napoleon already have a wife? Well, yes. He did. Josephine and Napoleon had become quite fond of one another, but now that Napoleon was playing the monarch game, he needed a male heir, and his aging wife wasn't giving him one. So it was out with the old and in with the new. At least he didn't behead anyone. For Austria, they felt that if Napoleon was going to keep on winning, they may as well be on his side. So through the marriage, Napoleon got an alliance with Austria and a beautiful baby potato. Between the failing blockade against Britain, the ongoing war in Spain, and now his recent struggles in Austria, cracks in Napoleon's invincibility were beginning to show. But still, look at this map. So blue. 
so beautiful. Even Sweden, after being pulverized by Russia, overthrew their king, and after an interesting chain of events, ended up putting one of Napoleon's own marshals in charge. Mar it's incredible the destiny of this guy. He starts as a soldier. Then, during the French Revolution, he quickly rises to a high position, a bit like Napoleon, and actually might have been chosen uh, alongside Napoleon by the consulate. But uh, it was kind of Napoleon's rival. They even had some, <laughs> so, some women's affair uh, and that didn't help. But um, imagine you're at home, you're chilling and knock knock uh, Swedish diplomats and they are proposing to you the, the Swedish crown. Uh, and why him? Basically because the, the Swedish king had no hair. Swedes were looking for a French marshal because they wanted to take some lands back. You, you see, they just lost Finland. Uh, and Bernadotte was a very capable general, but a great administrator. And he had some ties with Swedish because uh, he treated Swedish prisoners very uh, uh, well. And thus he was kind of popular in Sweden. And I guess we'll talk about him later. Marshal Bernadotte took the name Karl Johan and became Crown Prince of Sweden after agreeing to join Napoleon's continental system. For now, Sweden was Team France. Napoleon was on top of the world. He had won an endless string of victories. All he had to do now was sit back and not make any major miscalculations that could completely turn the tide of war. So let's see what comes next. France's alliance with Russia was a terrifying prospect. Together, the two could have been unstoppable. But unfortunately, the alliance didn't last. The Russians felt they weren't getting a fair deal. Napoleon's Duchy of Warsaw right on their doorstep was a bit of an insult. And then their economy began to tank because of Napoleon's British blockade. And eventually, they began to open up trade. Your Majesty, it seems Alexander is no longer abiding by the continental system and has begun trading with the British. Alex and why should, should he oblige if it's having a toll on its economy and, and he has nothing to, to gain from sorry, an alliance with Napoleon, right? Alexander? But he kissed me. He kissed you? You wouldn't get it, Pierre. No one would ever kiss you. <laughs> the security of Napoleon's empire depended on removing the British threat, and he wasn't happy with Russia's backdoor shenanigans. And so in 1812, Napoleon decided to go to war. He gathered together the most massive army Europe had ever seen, made up of troops from every corner of his empire, and he prepared to invade. Okay, it looks like Napoleon's coming for us. Generals, I need ideas. We could stand and fight. No, that's stupid. You're stupid. We could run away. You. You're a star. You'll remember Napoleon's tactics relied on astonishing speed to outmaneuver his enemy and force a quick, decisive battle. Well, I've got two words for you. Scorched Earth. If his opponent retreated while scorching the earth, his men couldn't live off the land. And if his men couldn't live off the land, he needed his supply trains. And if he needed his supply trains, he couldn't move quickly. And if he couldn't move quickly, he couldn't outmaneuver his enemy. And if he couldn't outmaneuver his enemy, I think you get the point. Napoleon launched his invasion and hoped for a quick battle, but all he could do was try to catch the retreating Russians while moving deeper and deeper into hostile territory. As he went, the horribly hot summer devastated his army. His men died of heat, exhaustion, and disease. Supplies began to run out, and his men began to starve. Many deserted, and still the Russians continued to retreat. And at this point of history, uh, when it comes to warfare, people die more often from diseases, malnutrition, attrition, than on the actual battlefield. And here you see, at your first real encounter with the, the enemy, uh, your army is already reduced by half. Treat. Numerous times, Napoleon considered turning back, but that little voice in his head kept on telling him, keep going, just a little further. And don't worry, you're definitely average height for the time. He nearly caught the Russians at Smolensk, but it was his birthday, so he had a party instead. When he finally reached Moscow, he predicted the Russians wouldn't be willing to give up such a historic and holy city without a fight. And he was right. The Russians finally turned to face him for the single deadliest day of the Napoleonic Wars, the Battle of Borodino. The Russians fought valiantly, and as he got older, Napoleon's battle tactics seemed to become a little less refined and a little more run straight at the enemy, try not to die. 
he launched a full frontal assault at the Russian defenses, and as a result, the death toll was colossal. The uh, Russians are heavily entrenched in great redoubts with sizable artillery. So in order to seize these redoubts, you're going to have a difficult time. On the other side, Napoleon's forces are exhausted, and Napoleon seems to be particularly cautious at Borodino. And against the advice of its general, he refuses to engage the Imperial Guard in order to secure a decisive battle here. The Russians eventually decided to retreat, leaving Moscow to fall into Napoleon's hands. Quick, the French are taking the city. Release all these prisoners immediately and tell them to burn it to the ground. Well, well. Jimmy the arsonist, you are not going to believe your luck. Moscow went up in flames, and as Napoleon entered, it became very clear his army wouldn't be able to stay there very long. But he had just defeated the Russian army and taken their most beloved city. In his mind, he had won. So he sent Tsar Alexander in St. Petersburg a letter. Your Imperial Majesty, Napoleon requests your surrender. How shall I respond? You shan't, Dmitri. No. Ever? Ever. No. But, Your Majesty, it will be winter soon. The French forces are stuck 500 miles into Russian territory with dwindling supplies. If we don't say anything, well, then they'll all die. Oh! After waiting for a response for about a month, the first snow of winter began to fall, and Napoleon sensed the catastrophe that was about to unfold. He decided their only choice now was to get out. And that's when it happened. It got cold. Stupid cold. His glorious invasion had just become a race for survival. As the Russians realized the French were fleeing for their lives, they began to close in on their So when they were in Moscow, uh, French soldiers looted the city. They took with them valuable furs, jewelry, and fancy dresses. To, uh, to bring back to their wives home. During the retreat, they have no proper winter cloth. They are dying from the cold. So they have to cover themselves with whatever they can, included these dresses. And imagine that, an army of ghost starvings and wearing dresses. I mean, apocalyptic view. Ply line, men froze to death, their horses as well. There was starvation and disease. The injured and dying could only be left by the side of the road as it was too slow to try to carry them. And all along the way, the dreaded Russian Cossacks stalked the bleeding French army and every now and then swept in for a quick attack. Napoleon, fearing capture, kept a vial of poison around his neck. At one point, the Russian armies nearly trapped him against the Berezina River, but a little Napoleon cleverness gave him the old Jeffrey Duke, tricking them into thinking he was going south and then escaping across rapidly built pontoon bridges to the north. When the Russians realized where he was and began to close in, the French burned the bridges before everyone could cross. Hundreds drowned and thousands were captured. During this battle, uh, here the engineer corps are going to throw themselves in the icy water in order to build uh, these bridges and eventually they are going to sacrifice themselves to allow the army to, uh, to escape. At this point, Napoleon got wind of plots against him forming in Paris, so he abandoned his men and went back to France. The remaining French stragglers made it across the border. It's been estimated over 600,000 men went into Russia. Let and he's lost his cavalry and one thing it, that you cannot easily replace is a cavalryman because you need to have horses and capable guys to ride them. Less than a hundred thousand returned. Napoleon was now in a very precarious situation. His army had just been obliterated and the other European leaders smelled blood. Here was an opportunity to take advantage of a weakened Napoleon, regain territory and influence, and liberate Europe from his dirty French paws. And so they began to turn. Prussia soon broke their alliance and switched sides, while Austria declared neutrality. Even Sweden, led by one of Napoleon's old marshals, joined the Allies, partly due to Napoleon's earlier invasion of Swedish Pomerania. The War of the Sixth Coalition had begun. The coalition forces had been reforming their armies, and they were now much better. And the UK had also significantly amped up its financial aid to its continental allies. Their armies quickly advanced through Poland and into Germany. In Paris, Napoleon was understandably freaking out. He needed to put together a new army fast, and he called up over a hundred thousand new conscripts, mostly teenagers. 
He also put his factories into overdrive. And he was like, you, make more rifles. You, build new cannons. You, make more horses. I don't make horses. Then who makes horses? Horses make horses. Explain how. Well, when a daddy horse and a mommy horse love each other very much. Yes, go on. Well, then the daddy horse. I'm sorry, Napoleon. You're 43. I thought you'd know this stuff. Don't touch me. I'm gonna be sick. As it turned out, Napoleon's lack of horses would take the biggest toll on his army, since his tactics relied on speed, maneuverability, and destruction. When he took the fight to the Allies in 1813, he did defeat them and sent them running. But lacking cavalry, he was unable to effectively pursue and destroy. Most of the casualties on the battlefield are inflicted to the enemy once he's routing. And so you you let your cavalrymen uh, destroy the, or capture the guys who are routing. He needed horses. For the Allies, being defeated in battle by a man whose army was now full of inexperienced conscripts was concerning. So both sides were like, hold up, time out. The Allies were somewhat cornered, and had Napoleon kept going, it's possible he could have won. But instead he agreed to a brief truce with the Austrians mediating between the two sides. When Austria demanded Napoleon make major concessions, Napoleon told them to shove it. Having had their terms rejected... You have a um, very famous and critical encounter between Napoleon and Metternich, uh, an Austrian diplomat. And at this point, uh, Metternich will politely suggest that Napoleon uh, and France go back to its natural border. And Napoleon keeps on refusing this. And then he say, F so fine. So we have no other choice than to join your enemies. Rejected. Austria felt now they were justified in saying, well, we tried and they joined the coalition. Okay, everyone, look at us. The boys are back together. But Napoleon is still dangerous, so we need a plan. Any ideas? Hmm. Ooh, I know. Ah, no, forget it. That's stupid. Ah! Oh, no, 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 no. I've got it! When he approaches, we run away. Genius. He's a genius. The plan. How do you defeat the greatest tacticians of its time? You don't fight him. And Bernadotte knows Napoleon very well. And he has the key to defeat him. And I have to say that this guy is uh, often portrayed as a traitor in France. And I was surprised uh, when I read in Napoleon's memoir how Clement he was with uh, Bernadotte. When he's especially harsh with its best marshals, he says, well, Bernadotte, he just plays his role. He serves his new country and I have nothing to blame him for. Yeah, surprising. Was as follows. Wherever Napoleon advanced, whoever he advanced on would avoid battle, allowing the others to sweep in from the sides and attack the French marshals guarding his flanks. Essentially, the plan was, don't try to fight Napoleon. And this plan worked tremendously. The Allies scored a number of victories that saw Napoleon move back to the city of Leipzig, where he would make one last major stand as the Allied armies converged in on him from all sides. The stage was set for the biggest and bloodiest battle of the Napoleonic Wars, the Battle of Leipzig. Almost half a million troops from over a dozen nations stretched across the battlefield. The French found themselves fighting on all sides for four days against the Austrians, Prussians, Swedes, and Russians. It's no wonder this battle is also sometimes referred to as the Battle of the Nations. The French fought ferociously, but ultimately were no match for the coordinated efforts of the coalition. At one point, in the midst of battle, Saxon troops allied with the French had a team huddle and were like, hey guys, I'm pretty sure the French are losing. Let's switch sides. And so they did. When it became clear that Napoleon couldn't... See, that, that's the problem with being coercive with your allies. The first opportunity they will have, they will turn on you. When he ordered a retreat across the only bridge over the river, the allies swarmed into the city and desperate fighting raged in the streets. Okay, Corporal, after everyone has crossed the river, I need you to blow up the bridge. Okay? Not before everyone's crossed. After. You got that? Yes, Colonel. I'm not five. I can comprehend time. Good. Wait, did he say before or after? Well, fortune favors the bold. The bridge was blown early and 30,000 French troops were stranded and captured. A disaster. 
And with that, the dominoes were beginning to come crashing down on Napoleon. In the south, an army under the British Duke of Wellington had been pushing the French out of Spain for the past few years and were now crossing into France. Austrian armies had pushed into Italy, while Napoleon's old flamboyant cavalry commander, Murat, who Napoleon had made king of Naples, decided to switch sides. German states, many resentful after years under Napoleon's thumb, turned against him and the Confederation of the Rhine collapsed. Bernadotte invaded Denmark and they were forced to join the coalition, while the Netherlands were liberated. You'd think Napoleon might have seen the writing on the wall, but he was Napoleon, and so instead, he prepared to keep fighting. As attitudes in Paris were already beginning to turn against him, he called up more conscripts to defend the exhausted nation. As for the Allies, they weren't sure exactly what they were aiming for here. A few peace offers were floated that may have let Napoleon keep his position, but the British kept throwing around even more money, and eventually, they all agreed that the ultimate aim was the deposition of Napoleon entirely. And so, Napoleon embarked on one of his most famous campaigns to defend the homeland. He was completely outnumbered, but the Allied armies had split up and spread. Blucher, remember his name, he'll come back later. But out. His army was so small that he could move at lightning speed, and he used this to his advantage. In the famous Six Days campaign against Prussian General Blucher, he attacked from all directions and defeated Blucher's forces four times, only suffering a tenth of the casualties he inflicted. Even with his back completely to the wall, Napoleon was still Napoleon. Then he turned south to take on Schwarzenberg's Army of Bohemia and enjoyed even more victories. However, Napoleon's problem was that he couldn't be everywhere at once, and wherever he wasn't, the Allies continued to push towards Paris. He made one last ditch attempt at moving in behind the enemy lines and cutting off their communications, but Paris was in disarray and the people were sick of war. One ambitious and slightly treacherous politician sent the Allied armies a letter basically saying, Hey guys. Talleyrand is a diplomatic genius. Some people in France perceive him as a traitor. I don't think he was a traitor. He wanted to serve France above everything and maybe his own interest, obviously. But um, he started to turn away from Napoleon because Napoleon was not listening to him. And he repeatedly advised to Napoleon that he'd be more gentle, more compromising when he was negotiating peace, not to, uh, to put its uh, former enemies in a desperate situation. And then, yeah, these guys will break up their relations and Napoleon will eventually tell Talleyrand that he's a turd in the silk stockings. Guys, come on in. And so, they did. The city's defenders surrendered, and as the Allied leaders entered Paris, the people cheered them as bringers of peace. Paris had fallen. Quick, marshals, gather your men. We're gonna launch an assault on Paris. <laughs> Where are my marshals? They all left and told me to give you this note. Napoleon's marshals had realized what he hadn't. It was over and they insisted all that was left now for the good of France was for him to abdicate. And without the support of his army, Napoleon had no choice. He hoped his son could take his place, but it was decided instead to restore the old Bourbon monarchy. Old King Louis XVI's brother would become the King of France. It was almost like the French Revolution had never even happened. But what will we do with Napoleon? We can't have a hyperactive 44-year-old menace running around reigniting revolutionary ideals and plotting his return. Well, why don't we send him... I don't know. There. The location chosen for Napoleon's exile was the small island of Elba, just off the coast of Italy. Napoleon was to rule over the island and even got to keep the title Emperor of Elba. The Allies must have been in stitches 
when they came up with that. When he learned what his fate was to be, he drank the poison he had been keeping around his neck. But it had gone out of date, so instead of a quick and painless death, he got a painful stummy wummy instead. Before he left France, he addressed his oldest and closest guard one last time, making an emotional speech that ended with him kissing their flag. And off he went. Yeah, the farewell to the guard is a very emotional moment. These guys are with him since the beginning. Napoleon has this very, very special bond with them. Uh, it's a costume to address soldiers directly using their names and telling them uh, you were with me at Austerlitz or Marengo or in Italy. Uh, and then, for example, he took a medal from his chest and put it on the soldier's chest. And so these guys are going to remain faithful to Napoleon to the end of him. I mean, even after uh, Russia, after Leipzig, after the fall of France, they are still loyal to the emperor. Yeah, so I must tell something. To exile. The deal that was given to him was actually quite generous. His family were given titles, he was to receive a state pension from France, and he was able to receive many distinguished visitors, all eager to come and meet the famed emperor. And he ruled over Elba well, improving infrastructure and introducing many legal and social reforms aimed at improving life on the island. Hey Napoleon, just coming in to check on how it's all go- holy smokes! But it wasn't all good. For one thing, he learned of the death of his first wife Josephine and was deeply saddened. He was forbidden from seeing his son and current wife, and in Austria, Emperor Francis had ordered a local count to seduce her, so she would forget about Napoleon. Then, the new King Louis XVIII refused to give Napoleon his agreed pension. He was under constant threat of assassination, and there were even rumors that the Allies were thinking of relocating him somewhere even more remote. But the biggest problem was that Napoleon was once the master of Europe. He had lived a thrilling life of adventure, fame, and glory. Now he found himself on a tiny island in the Mediterranean. And he was bored. Wouldn't it be nice if he could somehow return to France and reclaim his throne? Hey Napoleon, wanna go back to France and reclaim your throne? I would, Pierre. But how? Well, I was thinking we could just take this boat. Will that work? Surprisingly, yes. yes. Pierre, remember when I told you no one would ever kiss you? Yes, sire. Well, pucker up, boyo. Yay. When Napoleon left Elba, it wasn't really the daring escape you might think. He basically had kind of a leaving ceremony, hopped on a ship, and sailed back to France. And here is what I personally call the greatest fan service in all of human history. He brought with him an army of about a thousand men, and he began his journey to Paris. However, in Paris, there was now a new king, and at first, the people largely accepted him because the last few years of war under Napoleon had brought immense death and economic suffering. That's right, the king is back, baby. Divine right to rule. Don't worry, everyone. I know the economy is kaput, but I and my courtiers will withdraw into this palace, and we will definitely work as hard as we can to fix everything. Oh yeah, that's why we got rid of the king. As the Bourbon monarchy began to look more and more like a return to the past, and the returning nobility seemed hellbent on regaining their lost privileges, the people weren't too happy. And so, Napoleon hoped that his glorious return would be met with jubilation. In the end, the reaction was a little mixed, but many were happy to see their old emperor. Your Majesty, it seems that Napoleon is back and marching this way with a thousand men. That guy? No problem, I have hundreds of thousands of men. Send them to arrest him. Uh, your Majesty, it seems the thousands of men we sent to arrest Napoleon have all joined his side. 
Well, I'm off to Belgium. If you ever need a king again, be sure to let me know. As Napoleon continued his journey, the king had sent battalions of men to stop him, but they largely comprised of Napoleon's old soldiers, many unhappy with King Louis's military reforms. And so, when ordered to arrest him, they simply couldn't do it. In one famous incident, the troops began to cry out, long live the emperor. And I don't know if you're familiar with this scene, but at some point, uh, Napoleon advances in front of the soldiers. He opens up his coat and say, shoot at your emperor if you dare to. And the absolute balls of this guy. When Napoleon reached Paris, with King Louis having fled, he entered unopposed to reclaim his throne. Napoleon was back from the dead. Okay everyone, now that we've finally gotten rid of that guy, let's try to make sure something like this can never happen again. What's that doing there? Hey fellow monarchs! <laughs> this time Napoleon promised he would be a mucho mucho good boy and not start any wars. But the allied leaders were having none of it. They declared Napoleon an outlaw and the illegitimate ruler of France. Then they declared war, not on France but on Napoleon himself. And when you have multiple empires declaring war on you as an individual, that's how you know you're a very naughty boy. The Allied powers began making plans to combine their forces and once again invade France. The most immediate threat to Napoleon were the British and Prussians hanging out in nearby Belgium. If Napoleon could knock them out quickly, maybe he could force the Allies to negotiate and maybe he could hold on to his power. That's a lot of maybes, huh? Together, the two armies to the north outnumbered him, so he made a plan to divide them and take them on separately. Historians debate how much of a chance Napoleon had here, but this same strategy of dividing and conquering had worked for him multiple times. He marched north with 125,000 men and took on the Allies in a number of initial engagements, defeating the Prussians before turning to take on the British. But to Napoleon's dismay, miscommunication and hesitation among his marshals allowed both enemy armies to retreat. And crucially, rather than fleeing east, the Prussians moved north, where they could remain in contact with the British. Napoleon sent a force to hold off the Prussians as he moved in on the British, now holding a defensive position at Waterloo. Prussian General Blücher sent word that he would come to Wellington's aid if he could just hold off the French for long enough. Napoleon had to defeat Wellington before the Prussian army could arrive in force, and it was close. The British held the high ground and a number of key defensive buildings across the battlefield, after which... Basically, Napoleon's plan is here. He has to, to seize Hougoumont in order to instill it there and and use it against the British lines, then La Essence, then Papelot before I can launch a big uh, offensive against uh, Wellington. Problem is that British soldiers are very, very heavily entrenched in Hougoumont and they have some kind of uh, sharpshooters there, uh, soldiers that are equipped with uh, rifled guns and they are going to inflict a lot of casualties in, uh, in the French lines. Waiting some hours he didn't have for the ground to dry, Napoleon sent men to assault the Hougoumont farm, but the British German garrison there held out. French Marshal Ney launched a number of miscalculated cavalry charges at the British lines. So at some point, Ney, who is kind of a hot-headed guy, uh, thinks he witnesses a British retreat. Then he orders this massive uh, cavalry charge that he personally leads, by the way. And some of its soldiers said afterwards that Ney was obviously trying to be killed there. The British formed defensive square formations, and they tore the French cavalry to shreds, while one guy chose the absolute worst time to go on a bender. The French did manage to capture a farmhouse directly in front of the British line, and from there, they unleashed artillery hellfire on the British square formations. And as Napoleon sent his imperial guard in to finish the British off, a nervous Wellington knew his lines were at breaking point. But the Prussians had earlier begun to arrive, and now they were arriving in large numbers. And after the British held out and sent the French Imperial Guard running, the French lines panicked. It's maybe the, the last iconic moment of the Napoleonic warfare is when 
the Imperial Guard is uh, sent into a, a kind of a Hail Maria offensive and they receive this massive volley of uh, the, the British lines and they are uh, stumbling in front of the other soldiers and they start to retreat and then it instills panic in the French ranks. Fearing they had been encircled and they began to flee, the Battle of Waterloo was an Allied victory. And before that, so the Imperial Guard is going to have one last great moment. They form up a last square in order to allow the retreat of the French army. They are surrounded by English and they are asked to surrender. And then uh, they first say the, the guard uh, dies but does not surrender. And they offered once last time to, to surrender and they just answer merde or uh, nuts. And with that, Napoleon's hopes of returning to glory were vanquished. He knew he was defeated. He went to the British and said, Can I please have a house near London? And the British replied, No. Instead, to make sure Napoleon was put away once and for all, they sent him to one of the most isolated and remote places they could think of. A tiny island in the Atlantic Ocean, St. Helena. Here, a deeply isolated and depressed Emperor Napoleon would live the remaining years of his life. His house was a wooden bungalow, not exactly on par with the Tuileries Palace. Much to his frustration, his captors referred to him as General, rather than calling him Emperor. His mail was censored, his visitors were vetted. There was almost no way he could escape such an isolated island. But just to be sure, he was guarded by 2,000 British soldiers and two ships that circled the island 24 hours a day. He had once been the most powerful man alive, and images of the victorious Napoleon depict a strong leader, hand firmly in jacket. Depictions of Napoleon on St. Helena show a disheveled old man, hand firmly in pants. He had lost everything. And by the way, he was only 46, so maybe it's about time you, um, you know what? You're doing all right, kid. Napoleon fought one last battle while on the island. The battle for his reputation. He spent hours writing his memoirs, espousing his achievements, recording his greatness, and turning himself and his story into a phenomenal legend. And in this... Maybe that's its greatest victory. He, he got to write its own legend, which is kind of rare if you think about it. Uh, how many great conquerors could do that? This battle, he certainly succeeded. His mark on history cannot be denied. After his defeat, the European monarchs had got to work restoring Europe to its traditional balance and reasserting their dominance. But after Napoleon had spread the influence of the French Revolution, these returning monarchs would have a difficult time regaining their absolute control. France returned to the rule of the Bourbons, but it would go on to stage another revolution and then another one. Reaction to Napoleon's rule in places like Germany and Italy propelled forward the ideas and feelings of modern unity and nationalism, and his Napoleonic code still remains the basis of law in various modern countries. The modern world owes a lot to Napoleon's legacy. He remains statistically possibly the greatest military general in history, and his revolutionary military tactics changed the face of warfare. He was the last truly great leader to both lead his armies in battle while retaining total political control over a vast empire. There's still hope for Joe Biden, but the man remains somewhat of an enigma and we still aren't sure exactly what to make of him in some regards. Was he the champion of the French Revolution, spreading equality wherever he went, or did he betray it by making himself an absolute monarch and restricting certain liberties? Was he an ambitious and aggressive conqueror, hellbent on bringing Europe to its knees? Or was he simply defending himself against an aggressive Europe, hellbent on reducing his power? And we're a bit schizophrenic on these questions in France. Some things will continue to be debated. Napoleon died at the age of 51, officially of stomach cancer, but some believe he may have been poisoned. The Don't think so. Um, it's true that arsenic was found in its stomach, but arsenic by then was of a common use, so no. The British buried him in a tin coffin, inside a mahogany coffin, inside a lead coffin, inside another mahogany coffin. I guess this time, they wanted to make sure he stayed where they put him. In 1840, his remains were moved to Paris, where they now rest under the dome of Les Invalides. The man from humble origins, with huge ambition, ruthless determination, immaculate skill on the battlefield, and a hefty dose of luck, who was determined to make his mark on history, did just that. There is no immortality, he said.
but the memory that is left in the minds of men. And in that sense, Napoleon knew he would live on forever. Oh, and to reiterate, he was definitely average height for the time. That was great. That was great. Uh, and I still love this guy. No matter what, I see its weaknesses, but it's a legend. Uh, let me know what you thought of this video and see you very soon for our next one. Cheers, guys.